This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, special episode recorded on February 27th, 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Today, I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at the Fox Chase Cancer Center. And now it's my duty to turn it over to today's host, Glenn Rawl. Hello, everyone. So this is going to be a very different episode from the kind that you've listened to, especially if you're a steady TWIV listener. So as many of you may know, uh, since September 2008, uh, Vincent has recorded probably about 50 episodes per year of This Week in Virology that have run continuously with no summer breaks through the holidays, even through this ridiculous winter that we've had. Um, Reliably, episodes continue to appear. But what we noticed, uh, and uh, I'm with Ann Scalco, who's one of my colleagues here at Fox Chase, and all three of us, as you may have heard from a previous episode, are co-authors with uh, Vincent on the Principles of Virology textbook. At one point when we were talking about um, TWIV, we noticed that despite dozens, now hundreds of episodes, no one's ever actually interviewed Vincent. And so we felt like it was high time, um, now into our almost 250th episode of TWIV. 270. 270, sorry. Wow. (laughs) Over 270 episodes. It was a good time for us to stop and talk about Vincent's career and some of the what got him interested in virology in the first place, a little bit about his research in the past and what he's doing currently, um, and some discussion actually about this, how he got interested in science communication and podcasting and what he sees as the future for virology and and science communication moving forward. So Anne and I uh, are going to be asking you questions this time. So now that we've lost all our audience, should we just stop? (laughs) Well, I wonder if you're actually a little bit nervous about this. this I'm not nervous at all. I'm actually quite relaxed because normally I would have a laptop with my show notes in front of me. And if I were doing a, an interview with guests, I'd be worried about you guys being nervous. Uh, so I'm fine. I'm you can, actually- You can still worry about us being I'm, anxious. Cra- I'm fine. quite relaxed and um, I'm, I am ready to let you take the reins for this TWIV. And thank you for, for doing this, by the way, and you for joining us. It's Anne. our pleasure. Oh, and, as, as you said, these are part of the team of principles in virology. So I'm very used to talking. Right. And arguing with you guys. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, we'll try, we'll try and keep the arguments actually to a minimum for uh, the okay. course of the next hour or so. Well, what we wanted to, to do, because one of the things that I'm impressed with with TWIV is the breadth of the listeners that, um, that you have and viewers that you have, ranging from high school students through uh, undergraduates, college students, postdocs, PIs, and many, many people who aren't involved in science. And so what I thought made some sense was to, for your career, go back to the very beginning um, of what got you interested in science to begin with and kind of quickly work our way through your various stages in your uh, professional career. Because I think there may be a perception from some of the listeners that you know, careers of folks like yourself are intentional, that you knew from birth exactly what trajectory you wanted to take and where you wanted to go. (laughs) And so there may be something instructive about knowing that, you know, quite a bit of this was, you know, consequence, accident, fortuitous. Serendipity. Serendipity. Sure. (laughs) So go all the way to the beginning. To little Vincent? Haploid. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's going to be a little uncomfortable well, if we go that far back. But <laughs> well, so, well, well how, old, how old were you when you really well, got you, interested in science? Let's start even before that. Let's oh. start, I was born in 1953, which was the year the structure of DNA was solved. And that tells you everything. That's why I'm a scientist. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was born in Patterson, New Jersey. My father was a physician and my mother was a high school English teacher. And those two are very important components, I think. So I was brought up in a household where we had a physician who was, which was a thoughtful profession back then. Yes. (laughs) And he was well respected. And it was sort of an air of, so it wasn't science, because as you know, physicians are not scientists, but it was an air of the human body and its miracles and all of that. And then on the other hand, my mother was an English teacher, so I got my writing skills from her. 
So the component of all this communication is writing, as you know, I blog, and I absolutely owe it to her to teach me how to write well, I think. So I grew up in this household where I had the writing and the science of the medicine. And of course, I was expected to be a physician. You can yes. ask me a question? Yes. I, <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <laughs> so I went to, so I had a very nice high school career. And let me tell you about high school because that was the first, that's really to answer your question, mm -hmm. how I got interested in science. So it was expected I would be a physician. So I was taking a lot of science in high school. I took an advanced placement biology class. And the teacher, Mrs. Doden, was fabulous. She had done some research. And I, I was just enthralled by how she taught it. She told us about how she you know, washed her glassware so carefully to do the research. And I just thought this was great. And this was the first inkling that research could be interesting. Because then that, to that point, it had been all about medicine. And then I went to, I had a great high school career. I was second in my class, salutatorian, I guess that's called. And I'm not boasting, it's just I, I really enjoyed all the subjects and I worked really hard. You're boasting a little. I was actually an athlete for the first two years. Really? What did you do? I played soccer and I wrestled. So watch out. Whoa. <laughs> I'll, I'll back off well, the snarky questions. You have to worry about him. <laughs> so I, I did that for two years, and then it was just too hard to keep in shape and on weight. And I went to my guidance counselor. His name was Lars Larson. He was, he was also the wrestling coach. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm quitting. And he looked at me and said, I could make you a state champion, you know. I said, no, I, I want to study really hard now and, and get into a good school. So I quit sports, and I did other things. I actually worked on the, um, the school newspaper. I became the editor. I did acting, and I studied science, and I ended up doing well, and I got into Cornell. I was really excited to go to Cornell. And then, of course, I was expected to uh, become a doctor, and that's where the problem began because then I didn't want to be a doctor anymore. I had no interest in it. So... I ended up not getting into any medical school. I don't even remember applying to very did many. Did you apply? A yes. few, but I, put, I did not put my heart into it whatsoever. Um, did you think at that time that you knew that you wanted to be a scientist? No, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I just knew I didn't want to be a physician. But m m part of my personality is not to say to my father, no, I don't want to do this, but to just push it under the rug and ignore it. Passive aggressiveness. Were you worried that you were going to disappoint? Probably, probably. Yes, I've, not I, I've noticed that in chapters. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, I didn't want to disappoint them, but on the other hand, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I remember at one point as a freshman, I had taken an art history course and I came home at Thanksgiving. I said, I want to be an art history major. And they looked at me and said, you'll never get a job. And they were right. <laughs> but from that point on, I wouldn't tell them what I was thinking because I didn't want the rejection. So I graduated in four years, didn't get into any medical school. I majored in biology. Did you do any research while you were in I college? did no research. I took a lot of courses, some microbiology. Uh, there was no virology course at the time. And I went home to uh, North Jersey. And I said, I need to do something. I, I got no advice from anyone. So I applied for lab tech position. <clears throat> I, I wrote out to a, a number of companies uh, in New Jersey, and I got a position at a laboratory. And if you are a good interviewer, you will find out what I did there. But if you have to no, be a I'm good a lousy interviewer. interviewer. <laughs> so why, don't you, why don't you tell me what you did there? You have, this is the story that no one has ever heard, and you might not want to hear it. What I did at this company um, for I, a year, I, I worked there for six months or nine months, and I realized. Uh, I needed to go back to school. Can you, can you say which company it was? The name of the company was Schmid Laboratories. And the products they made, they made condoms, spermicides, and vaginal antibiotics. Do you want to hear more? No. <laughs> a, li a, a little more. <laughs> so the condoms were of several kinds. And I was involved in sterility testing. So some of the condoms were made from lamb intestines, okay? These are, I think they're called 4X, they were. So these are lambs from New Zealand that were slaughtered and the intestines were put in a uh, antimicrobial solution. And we would get them 
uh, packaged in little containers, and then they had to sit for two weeks, and after that time, we'd do a sterility test. We would dilute the fluid and plate them out and see if there were colonies. And when there were no colonies, they would be released for sale. But if there were colonies, we had to pick them and identify them. And I loved doing that. That was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. The uh, spermicide, I had to do potency testing every week. I would come in on Friday morning and open the incubator, and there would be a vial of, of donor sperm there, which I had to dilute and mix with this spermicide and, and look at the motility under the microscope and say it's killing them and release it for people to use. Uh, and then the vaginal cream was for trichomonas infections. And again, I had to grow trichomonas cultures and make dilutions and potency testing. So those were just some of the things I did. I did a lot of microbiology. Um, it was very interesting. And I want to tell you one story, which is the most interesting of all. There was a room where they tested the condoms. OK? Just uh, keep going. They had. <laughs> So the way is this going to be X-rated? No, it's not X-rated. <laughs> this is really funny. If you don't want to hear it, yep. but the go. listeners will yes. miss it. No, yeah, I'm no, sure. I, I, I suspect so, that there are a good fraction that want to know about them. The, uh, these lambskin condoms, what they would do is they had a room with rows and rows of desks and ladies with nets on their hair and white oh. coats. Oh, boy. And they would take the condom out and they would tie it to uh, a hose and fill it with air and then they would submerge it in a vat of water, and they would look for bubbles. And if there were no bubbles, they would take it out and repackage it for sale. So that's Reuse how they, those? Yeah, they were checking for holes in the intestines. And then the latex ones. So the latex ones they actually made. There was a row of these golden shapes that would dip into latex and come out coated with latex. It would then dry, and the ladies would roll them down and put them into big buckets. And then they would take them over to someone else. And then on front of their desk, there was a long golden shaft. Oh, they would put the condom on it and then hit a foot switch. It would fill up with air. And if there were no holes in it, then they would put it in, and go off for sale. You know, it was for, so funny. For our listeners who aren't watching the video, they're really missing out because you're using some really excellent hand motions. I would <laughs> actually, if, if you guys weren't here, I would use more descriptive language, but I think you're a little conservative. Yes. So, <laughs> so, anyway, so after that, I said I have to go back to school and ask me about that story. Well, will you just give me a chance? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm very excited to talk about myself. Yeah. I, <laughs> It's been 270 episodes just <laughs> bubbling up inside. All right, I'll shut up. No, well, so, but what made you decide that you wanted to go back to school? Like, was there an epiphany that made you say, I have to be a scientist? Or was it sort of a, a slow burn over time that you sort of found that you liked the microbiology aspects of this job? So I love the microbiology. I love picking colonies and identifying them. That was a lot of fun. All the other lab manipulations, diluting, making solutions. Uh, we used to pour little agar slants that were used in physicians' offices for various diagnostic purposes. We actually would pour them and solidify them and sell them. I loved doing all of that. But I realized I didn't know anything. And in this company, there were mostly people with master's degrees who didn't, and they were my boss, but they didn't know anything either. And I thought, I just don't, I love science, but I don't want to be in this position where I'm working and I don't know anything, so I need to go back to school. Now, at the same time, during that period I was working, I read a book called Fever uh, by John Fuller. Mm -hmm. And this is the um, story of the isolation of Lassa virus uh, in Africa in the 1960s, so really the first emerging virus infection. And that brought my eyes to virology. I said, I have to be a virologist. Mm. I have to do this stuff. So I started to apply to master's program. So you have to remember, I'm at home. I'm getting no guidance whatsoever from anyone. So I said, let me apply to master's programs. I, I applied to NYU and Rutgers. And I wasn't really sure what was the right thing, the next move. But I applied. And then uh, this was the most important part. One night, I went to dinner at a friend's house in the next town. It was Ridgewood, New Jersey. And this boy's name, I'd gone to Cornell with him. His name was Edwin Kilborn. Does it ring a bell? No. Do you know? Yes, it does. Kilborn virus. So his father was Ed Kilborn, Kilborn chair yes. of microbiology yes. at Mount Sinai. Yes. And it just so oh. happens that I had gone to college. He was a great friend of mine. So I went to his house for dinner. And after dinner, uh, Dr. Kilborn came out. And he said, so Vinny, what are you going to do with your life? And I said, 
I, I want to be a virologist. I want to, I'm applying to these master's programs. And he said, no. He said, forget it. He said, forget the master's. Don't bother. It's a waste of time. Come to Mount Sinai and get your PhD. So this was August. It was very late. Wow. Right? So the next day, I went for an interview. I got in. And a few weeks later, I went into this PhD program. So was it, was it the way it is That's now? That's fantastic. Or? <laughs> That's a great story. So when Ed is Kilburn, ser serendipity. When yeah. Ed Kilburn died a, a year and a half ago, I wrote a blog post. And uh, I, I told this story about how important he had been to my career. And his family actually saw it, and they invited cool. me to give a, a, a eulogy at his, at his funeral. So oh, I, they said, cool. you're the only person who's saying nice things about Dr. Kilborn because he was the one who convinced President Ford to immunize the U.S. with the swine flu vaccine in 1976. And that didn't go so well. So, of course, when the Times wrote his obituary, that's what they focused on. So there's times I think that, you know, how I ended up where I am, where you ended up where you are, is so a matter of chance. Do you think if you hadn't, I know this is a sort of what if question, but if you actually hadn't had that dinner with your friend and the father hadn't come out and asked, do you think you'd still have been a virologist? Probably not. I would have gone to a, a crappy master's program. I mean, no, no uh, disrespect intended, but I would have gone to a lousy master's program. Maybe if I was lucky and I got the right advisor, he or she would have said, you should get a PhD. So who knows? I would guess probably not. But, you know, having gone to Mount Sinai, I ended up in Peter Palazzi's lab. So and that was a crucial part of, of yes, doing well. Yes. You know? so, so that is quite interesting because did you know that Peter Palazzi was a postdoc of Aaron Shatkin when, right. I, when, it, when uh, Aaron and I were colleagues at the Roche Institute. McCausland, wasn't it? Brian McCausland? No, he was there with no, Shatkin. He was? Okay, I'll yeah. take your word for maybe it. it. Maybe it was McCausland. You think it was McCausland? Yeah, because he worked on frog virus. Ah, yes, yeah. that's right. <laughs> but he was there in the very early days. Yes. And, do you remember uh, him? Yes, I do, yes. And uh, he was a contemporary, a postdoc, along with Lynn Enquist. Right. So, yeah, it's a small world. It is a small yeah. world, yes. Did graduate school work the same way as it does now where you do rotations, or did you go into Mount Sinai knowing that you wanted to work with Peter? No, we had rotations. Um, we actually had, uh, we had a, we spent a week in every lab just reading papers and talking with the PIs, and then we chose three rotations. And uh, one of the rotations with, was with a professor called Anthony Garrow who worked on phages, and I, I really liked that. I, I also rotated in... Peter's lab, and I believe, oh, uh, Jim Wetmer, Jim Wetmer's lab, who was one of the people who developed the kinetics of DNA hybridization with Julius Marmer at Caltech. You probably know Julius Marmer, right? I do, but I knew him at Einstein. Yeah. He was at Albert Einstein. Right, right. Yeah. Then he moved. Yeah. So uh, I, after those three rotations, I decided to, uh, to join Peter's lab. That was an easy choice? No, actually... It was complicated. Do you want to hear about it? Yes. So originally, this was the beginning of the swine flu outbreak. And, and by this time, uh, Kilbourne's swine flu vaccine was being put into millions of Americans. And one of the junior faculty in the department said to me, you should go work with Kilbourne because he's going to get all these sera and you can do cool stuff. And I didn't know anything. So I said, sure. So I went to... Dr. Kilborn, and I said, I want to do my thesis with you. And he said, oh, wow, great, sure. And then a few days later, uh, Anthony Garrow, who was the chair of the admissions committee, the graduate program, he called me in his office, and he said, what the hell do you think you're doing? He said, I had a really strong um, New York accent. You can't work with him. You won't get anything done. He won't pay any attention to you. I said, okay, well, who do I work with, and what do I do? So he said, you should work with Peter Palazzi. His star is rising, I'm imitating his accent. <laughs> I said, okay, I'd love to, but how do I get out of the Kilborn thing? He said, you leave it to me. I'll take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a meeting in Kilborn's office with Garrow and Kilborn and Palazzi, and Kilborn was very uncomfortable. He said, well, we've decided that your day-to-day -day supervision should be with Peter Palazzi, and I should take a back seat. And basically, after that day, I never saw him again. <laughs> and I worked in Peter's lab. And so I'm so grateful to Tony Garrow, who is still around and I see periodically. 
that, it, I mean, he got me in the right lab, and I was Peter's first student, and uh, I, I know everything today because of what I started with with Peter. Yeah, yeah, and it, that's really important, and I think a, a, a lot of students don't, don't really see that, but it's really good to be somebody's first or second student because you do get a lot of attention. That's great. And with I the right it. person, it can really mean a lot. So that is, that's... As I, said, as I said at the talk today, he would come in the lab every mm -hmm. morning yep. and stop at my bench and say, so Vincent, what's new? And I would sit down for 10, 15 minutes and tell him. And I know that other students who came in after me hated that. They hated that he was bothering them. But Too I loved micromanaging. it. I thought this was great to have this attention yes. from a PI, right? How yeah. could it be bad? So right. I always appreciate it. And it really helped me guide my way of interacting with students later on when I had them. Yeah. So there's a difference between being interested in virology and being a good scientist, a good virologist. Like, how was that path for you during grad school? At what point did you realize that you were technically good? Was it easy from the beginning? Were there struggles along the way? So I, I should tell you, I finished my thesis in less than four years. And uh, I mean, experiments just worked. And Peter ended up saying to me yeah. once, you know, I hate to say it, but you have golden hands and you don't deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> so experiments, experiments went well. I had, I always was into technical things. I liked doing things uh, with my hands, taking apart TVs and radios, building things. So the lab work where you move around small liquids and manipulate gradients and gels, I loved all of that. So I, I really paid attention to the details, and things worked. And so I would do, for example, my thesis uh, project was to map the genome of influenza B viruses. These viruses have segmented genomes. And so back then, before sequencing, we would distinguish the two parental viruses by the migration of the RNAs on a gel. Mm -hmm. So you would right. co-infect cells with two viruses and take the yield and plaque it and in identify recombinants or reassortants with genes. Uh, ex uh, exchanged. So I did one infection, and from the yield, I got all the reassortance, single gene reassortance of these two viruses that I needed in one experiment. Hmm. And they were all on one gel, and he looked at it and he said, you don't, impossible. You, you don't deserve this. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very lucky that I, I loved the, tech, tech, the technical aspect of doing science, and I was good at it, my hands were good, and, and it was reproducible. What I lacked, I think, was an insight into the biology. I really didn't appreciate viruses at all for what, what they were doing in cells. And I think that came many years later. But I think the technology is a good start. So you're good at something. And I would guess that after two years in graduate school, I realized that I could do experiments reproducibly and that this was something that I could bring forward. Were you thinking about your like sort of job of permanence, your future career at that point, or were you just so in the mix of doing the that day's experiments that you really didn't have a sense of what you wanted to do as a long-term profession? I never thought about the next week. I just did the day-to-day -day experiments. Huh. I I never <laughs> thought about a postdoc. I never when I was a postdoc, I never thought about getting a job. When I had a job, I never thought about tenure. I just lived from week to week doing experiments. It's, and that was so satisfying to me. That mm. was enough. That was absolutely enough. Yes. I, yes. I mean, really, I mean, it sounds, it, it, maybe it sounds artificial, but I never looked forward. I just wanted to do experiments, and I thought about the next one after that, and that was totally satisfying. So would you recommend that? I mean, I realize that that to some degree is just who you are, but for grad students that are out there, would you recommend that they focus solely on their science or that they do, in fact, think about next steps in their careers? Well, I think science is probably more complicated now, and you, you would have the same thing I that's have, different from when you were I, young. I would right? agree with you. I had the same reaction. I never thought about jobs or anything. I was just having fun, and yeah. the next thing came, and then the next thing but I, I don't know that you can do that these days. Yeah. I think it is you, a different scene. I think you have to think about, yeah. I think one important thing is to think about communicating your science. Mm -hmm. And I think even as a student, as a postdoc, you should already start thinking about it. I think you should think in general terms about where you're headed in a career, if you want industry or academics or business or law or writing or something else. But I wouldn't worry about it. I would. I think that if you are focused on the science and you get things to work and you're passionate about it, 
whatever you want to do falls in place. So then how did you make the decision to go to Baltimore's lab as a postdoc? So as I was ending my, uh, my PhD uh, degree, I said, I said, all right, Peter said, what are you going to do? And I said, I want to do a postdoc because I want to, uh, I want to eventually stay in this field. And he said, okay, if you want to do that, uh, you should pick the best lab in the field. And I said, okay. And he said, what kind of virus do you want to work on? I said, I want to stay with RNA viruses. And I had all intentions of eventually coming back to flu because I loved the system. And uh, as we'll see, that was not an option at, at one point. But he said, okay, if you want to work on RNA viruses, the best lab is David Baltimore. And I said, okay. So I wrote David a letter and he wrote back and said, I'm sorry, I don't have any positions. This was before or after the Nobel Prize? This was, he had just received the Nobel Prize, all right? And I re actually received the letter, and you have to remember, because this comes back in a couple of years in, this, in a similar way, we have to revisit it. So I showed the letter to Peter, and um, he said, okay, I will call David and get you an interview, but if you get in, you have to go. I will not call him unless you promise that you go if you get a uh, position. So I said, sure, I'll go. And I was very scared because I didn't know anything about the lab. And who knows, I might not like it. But um, so I went for, uh, he called and I got an interview. The interview was an interesting experience. You want to hear about that or? Yes, yes. I do, sure. <laughs> so David was going to the retrovirus meeting at Cold Spring Harbor, which you know well. Right? I do know well. So he said, I'll be there in Long Island. And I was, of course, in Manhattan. He said, oh, why don't I meet you at 2 p.m. outside that that building where they have... Um, Blackford? It must be Blackford. It was, an old, it was before they built the new one, but it was, it's sort of down closer to the lake. To, as you go in, it's on the right. Demerits. They have uh, rooms upstairs. Yeah, that's Blackford. Blackford. That's where the men always stay. Okay. So he said, meet me outside at 2 p.m. So I'm there. I drove out there, and I'm waiting. I have a briefcase with pictures of my gels in it so, so I can show him. <laughs> Ran a lot of gels. And I wait, and it's 2.30, and 3 o'clock, and 3.30, and 4 o'clock, and finally it's 5 o'clock, and I don't know where he is. I went, I found where he was staying, and I went up to his room, and I opened the door, and all his stuff was there, but he wasn't there. And I'm waiting, and finally I said, forget it, I'm leaving. So I went to the parking lot, and I got to my car, and was about to get in, and I said, no, I really, I really want to do this. I want to go work for him, right? I want to at least try to... So I turned around and I went back and I sat outside and he finally showed up. What time? I think 6 p.m. or something like that. <laughs> and he said, oh, good, you're here. And I said, yeah, I've been waiting since 2. And he said, oh, I thought you would go to a session or something. <laughs> so I'm not going to the meeting. I'm too nervous to go to a session. So he sat down and he talked with me. I actually got a chance to show him uh, my gels. And he said, okay, I'll be in touch with you. And he ended up taking me. He said, but you have to work on polio. That was the condition. He said, yeah, I want you to come, but you need to work on polio. Ah. And you were okay with that? That's fine with me. What did I know? It it's was an a, RNA virus. an RNA virus. <laughs> I mean, the alternative was a retrovirus, Maloney probably. Mm -hmm. So I might have been in your field, who mm -hmm. knows. But I didn't. I, I ended up going and working on polio. So like, what was the RNA virus thing? Can you remember why that was like such a priority that no matter what, it, what you did, it had to be an RNA virus? It's only because I had been working on one for my PhD thesis. I was comfortable with it. I liked it. I enjoyed the system. And I did want to come back to influenza. There were so many things. This was 19, uh, 1979 when I was finishing up. And there was so much to do in I was influenza. 12. You were 12 years old? Yeah. So I Point wanted to do, uh, and to be honest, the, the DNA viruses were scary. They, um, they were too complicated. Nobody really understood what was going on. The genomes were too big. I didn't get origins of replication anyway. So <laughs> it was an RNA virus for sure. That's really it. I mean, it doesn't, you know, they're the things that you come up with as a, as a student. So often when postdocs start, they think that they're going to continue with the same sort of level of success that they had as a grad student, that this would just be now a continuation after coming off of the, the high of getting a PhD. So when you started in Baltimore's lab, did, were, were the golden hands continued to be successful or did you encounter challenges or problems? Tell me about how they were different as mentors, David and Peter. All right, so I got to, um, <clears throat> I got to David's lab and I remember 
walking into the building and I didn't know where to go. And there was a guy standing out front. He said, may I help you? He was very nice. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm a new postdoc with David and I need to find where he is. He goes, well, let me help you. He said, my name is Bob Weinberg. <laughs> and from that day on, he was my friend. It was, oh, I, you know, nice. we used to talk all the time. And in, in a few hours, you'll, you'll hear a story about Bob that is interesting. So he brought me to David. And David said, I want you to clone the genome of polio. The moratorium on recombinant DNA has just been lifted, and we can clone the whole genome. And then he left. And I was there to deal with it myself, to find the reagents, the virus, to make virus, to learn how to. So there were no kits. Right? I had to do everything from scratch. The only thing we had was reverse transcriptase from the NCI, mm -hmm. which they had got. Yeah. And I had to figure everything out. So I said, okay, this is great. I know how to do everything. I can figure things out. So I went and made friends, and I learned how to do things. So it was completely different. He was not there. I just had my coworkers to interact with. The polio lab was rather small. There was a very nice uh, fellow by the name of Ashim Dasgupta. As a, he was a postdoc, he was a senior postdoc in the lab, and he was really helpful. So I got virus, I got cells, I grew it up, I purified it. And I learned how to clone from someone in the retrovirus group. It was a little harder than being a student because I was totally on my own, and David did not help. So it was a totally different relationship. David would travel a lot. We'd meet maybe once a week. We'd have a group meeting, and he would hear about what you were doing and give you some suggestions. But you were really on your own, which I think is perfect for a postdoc. As a postdoc. I needed to learn how to figure things out on my own. And he gave me that space. So in retrospect, it was the perfect segue to Peter's lab. I got a nice project, but I had to figure out how to do it on my own mm -hmm. and not have right. someone hand me a protocol and right. reagents and this and, and do it. And I think you learn so much less that way. Right. So I, I remember. Um, I had a similar situation, and I remember Al Hershey, who, who was the person who was my postdoc mentor, used to say that at the point when you're a postdoc, you have earned the privilege of making your own mistakes. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> really good. How big was David's lab at that time? All right, so this was 19, this is the end of 79. I went there in September. Uh, the polio lab was four people. And then the rest, so there was a retrovirus group, and then he had started a big immunology group. Um, it was probably 25, 30 people total. Wow. So it was quite big. And then on the same floor, there was Phil Sharp's lab, mm -hmm. which was quite big. He had just discovered splicing not too many years before, so his lab was growing. And then David Hausman was also there as well. So it was the fifth floor of the cancer center at MIT. It was an incredibly active floor and lots of interactions. And the director of the cancer center and the person who had hired all these PIs was Salvador Luria. Mm -hmm. And he was still there mm. at the time. Mm. And I remember, one, so he was on the first floor. He was in the administrative offices. And I went down there to, to do some administrative thing with the secretary. And he came out and she introduced me to him. To, to him. And I... I told him my name, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and then he started speaking Italian to me. <laughs> Do you speak Italian? A little bit. So he said, di dove viene? Okay, which means, where do you come from? And I misinterpreted him. I thought he said, how are you? And I said, bene, grazie. <laughs> and he probably thought I was an idiot. <laughs> But then I realized, and I told him where I was from. He kind of looked, you know, I don't, do you, did I, you meet him? Or you oh, know yes, him? he was, he was the brother-in-law of Jerry Hurwitz, who was my, wow. my graduate student mentor. Yeah. Yes, so I did, kn I did know So Selva. when he, you know, he gave you that look when you said stupid things, and he gave me that look. But I we get that chatted look from a, you sometimes. I do? No, I don't mean it, though. <laughs> so we chatted a little bit. It was great to meet him. I mean, he's a legend, right? And, he is, uh, yeah. I would periodically see him and chat with him. It was just great. It was like another era there. Yes, it was another era. Was it a, so that must have been fascinating to move. I want to get to Columbia pretty quickly here. But it must have been such a, a, a change moving from such a small lab like Peter's starting laboratory to now this whole huge community. Was that, 
jarring for you? I know you said that in terms of the independence, this was perfect as a postdoc, but was there a, a, a good sense of community, even though the, the lab did different things? Was there a kind of family sense about okay. the group? So uh, before I got there, I was scared to death because I didn't know what to expect. I thought it would be rows and rows of postdocs who wouldn't talk to me and not help me at all, right? So I, I was just scared to death. And then when I got there, if I meet Bob Weinberg, who was very happy to help me. And then people were very friendly. There were a lot of really nice people. Steve Goff was there. He was very friendly. Uh, Fred Alt was there. Um, Suda Mitra was there. Um, Mitch Goldfarb was in the Weinberg lab. He, all these people were very nice. And then he had a slew of technicians who were really nice. I befriended a couple of them. And so the community was very good. They were all very helpful. I mean, there were some people who hoarded things. I remember there was uh, one lady who kept all the gel clips and the combs in her drawer. And <laughs> I learned something really important. So I was always very nice to her. So she was very aggressive and nasty often. And, but I was always very nice to her. And uh, then I went to, I said, Varda, do you have any gel clips? And she said, for you, I have gel clips. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so the charmer. You have to be nice to everybody. You never know when you are going to encounter them again, and they're going to have some control. And if you're not nice to them, they're going to take advantage of it. So my mo mantra has always been nice to people. So when you leave grad school, you know when to leave grad school. It's when you get your PhD. When did you know it was time to leave David's lab and start your own? So in David's lab, we ended up cloning the entire poliovirus genome as a DNA, determining its sequence. And then, of course, when I put that DNA into cells, we found it was infectious. And this was just a great finding. And that was a good break point for me to take that reagent and start my own lab. So it was really three and a half years, I think, of a postdoc, which is relatively short. Um, and I said, I'm, so I, I basically said, I want to leave and um, start my own lab. I had applied for jobs. I'd gotten an offer at Columbia and a couple of other places. I decided I wanted to go to Columbia. Why? But I thought that was a break. Okay, so I had, I had three main offers. The first was at uh, Case Western Reserve. It was my first interview. I didn't really want to go to Cleveland. And there wasn't any virology there, so I didn't particularly. I think Jonathan Lease was the only virologist there. Mm -hmm. I, I got a job offer at Stanford in microbiology, so Stan Falco was the chair. You know, Paul Berg was there and a lot of other famous people, but I didn't get the impression that any of them would ever talk to me. So I, <laughs> I, I was looking for colleagues, yes. all right? Yes. And there was no virology at Stanford at the time anyway. And then I had this offer at Columbia. There was Harry Ginsburg. He was the chair. Hamish Young was an adenovirologist. Saul Silverstein, uh, herpes. Uh, Steve Goff had gone there, retrovirus. And then Fred Alt was also there from MIT. So I said, this is the place for me to go. I'm going to feel comfortable. And mm -hmm. that's why I went. Bob Weinberg said to me, I asked him, how important are your colleagues? And he said, if you don't have good colleagues, it's the kiss of death for your career. Mm -hmm. And so right. I thought Columbia was the right set of colleagues for me. And I wasn't wrong. I was, told, I was told that exact thing by John Taylor when I interviewed here at the Cancer Center. That's that it's right. it's all but about it, who your colleagues are. Yeah. But it's true, isn't it? Yeah, well, it is true because that same level of support that you get as a postdoc with your peers, you need the same from your colleagues as a faculty. We do. You do. Mm -hmm. You should ask me about the, seat, the, the clone. You cannot let go, can you? Of what? <laughs> Glenn, the next question you should ask yeah, me okay. is. <laughs> you know, I, I listen. So one of my favorite podcasts is This Week in Tech. And the, he's actually my inspiration for This Week in Virology. The host is Leo Laporte. And he was once interviewed by his co-hosts like this. And he kept doing the same thing. And they said, could you please let us ask the question? Yeah, I feel their pain. Yes. <laughs> OK. You, you could ask the questions. I won't ask. So actually, I want to ask a very sort of specific question about um, the PVR transgenic mice. That's many years later. That's so in my lab, have, right? Do you have a, what's that? That's yes, my lab no. At so once you've gotten to Columbia. But actually, so what, what I'll, I'll give you this. What question am I not asking about your early career? Because you've been. No, no, it's OK. You want to know about PVR transgenic mice? No, actually, mice? well, so you started in 1982, right, as a faculty member at Columbia? That's right, yeah. Right. So you've been there for. 31 over, years. Yeah, for a super long time. So how did the lab, so give me a sense actually before we get to the PVR transgenics of how you decided that you wanted your lab environment to be. Like did you put thought into what the 
what the size of it was going to be, what the research focus, whether you wanted more grad students or postdocs? Okay, so I had an idea of where I wanted to head. Towards the end of the, the time in Davis Lab, I had this infectious poliovirus DNA clone, right? And I s had been reading John Holland's papers mm -hmm. where <clears throat> he was trying to understand why viruses had the tropism that they do. And poliotropism was very restricted. And he said, it's all about receptors. All right, that was his shtick. And he said, mouse cells don't have receptors and human cells do, so that's the important determinant of tropism. So I, I started getting interested in mice and using them as a model. I wanted to study pathogenesis. Yep. And I didn't want to use monkeys as a model, so I thought, can we, can we make a mouse model? And I first had landed on this virus called uh, type 2 Lansing polio. It's a strain of polio that came from Lansing, Michigan, that just happened to be able to be adapted to mice by a, a scientist at NIH. So he passaged it from mouse to mouse, and he ended up with a variant that could uh, infect mice if you put the virus intracerebrally. So I thought, I want to work on this in my lab in mice. And I remember one day I, I mentioned this to David. I said, I want to study you know, tropism and pathogenesis. He said, oh, that's just a receptor issue. That's not very interesting. So I figured this is something I should work on. <laughs> yes. So David doesn't think it's interesting. <laughs> it I'm going to work on it. So in his, uh, the last month or so in his lab, I actually grew up this, uh, this virus, this Lansing, and I cloned it, and I brought the clones with me uh, to New York. And I was going to use those to study pathogenesis. But they were restricted in what you could do. They, you had to put the virus right in the brain. It was, it was a weird mouse-adapted virus. And I always had in my head this receptor idea of John Holland. I said, if we could identify the human receptor, maybe we could put it in mice. And so that's where that idea germinated from, the Lansing virus. We did some work and published some papers on you know, what made it special. It turns out that you can take an eight amino acid sequence from the capsid of this Lansing strain and put it into any other strain of polio, and, it, and they will infect mice. Really? That's all there is to it. And to this day, I don't know what that's controlling. Yeah, I was going to ask why that's I do true. not know, and I would love to figure it out, but you know, there must be a receptor in the mouse that is being recognized, or who knows? We never sorted it out, but uh, we, we just turned to trying to make a transgenic mouse, and that's where that came from. In the meantime, we were using the clone to... Uh, look at some other problems in, in replication, but it was one of my first students, uh, Kathy Mendelson, she had heard me talk about this idea of, of identifying the receptor, and she rushed to me, and she said, I want to work in your lab. I want to clone this receptor. I said, okay. <laughs> and she was the one who ended up cloning it. Within a year, she had, had the gene. And it was because of Saul Silverstein. He said, I will help you. He had just developed co-transformation with Richard Axel, the ability to take a co-selectable marker and put it in cells with the gene and get that gene produced in cells. He said, I'll help you, and he helped us to clone him. So the, the people around me were really important. Yeah. So one of the things that made the construction of the transgenic mice likely to work, or at least gave you a reason to think it was likely to work, was that if you transfected in RNA into mouse cells, you could get replication to... Correct. To, so when did that happen relative to the identification of the receptor? So John Holland had done that in the 50s. That's one of the papers that had inspired me. He had shown that if you extracted RNA from polioviruses, you p transfected it into mouse cells, you would... Give, so he said, all you need is a receptor on the mouse cell to make it susceptible and permissive. So that was the inspiration, yeah. How long after identification of the receptor did you make the transgenics? Was that like your immediate next step, or did you want to do structural studies on the receptor, or...? So Kathy identified the receptor in, I think, 1989. And just as she was finishing, uh, a student entered my lab, Rebao Wren, and he wanted to make the transgenic. And this was actually the first conflict I had in my lab. I had a postdoc, a very good postdoc, Gerardo Kaplan from Argentina, and he wanted to take the clone and make a transgenic mouse. I said, no, this is, you have a project, this is Rebao, he wants to do this. So it was the difficult sorting mm -hmm. out. It was the first time I had, had to deal with this, right? I was very lucky up until that point. Everything was fine, people got along, and then these two were, and then Kathy ended up arguing with, with Kaplan all the time. And eventually I said, Rebao is going to make this, you can do something else. <laughs> <laughs> but he was very interested. I mean, he had, a, he had a lot of scientific curiosity. He wanted to do everything. I said, yeah, but this is a lab that 
everyone does their own thing. And he said, no, you should have everyone working on the same project. I said, no, I don't run my lab that way. I want people doing individual things. That's how they develop as scientists, not competing with one another. So I would guess that Rebau had the mouse. We collaborated with Frank Costantini at Columbia, who makes transgenic mice, and I think by 90, 91. So very quickly after she had the clone, we made the mouse. Do you remember when you knew that the mouse worked? when you had the transgenic mice and then you did the infections and you actually saw that the infection was resulting in pathogenesis? Do you remember that day or that event? I do. I do remember that day. So there are three days I remember very clearly experimentally. One was getting the infectious polio DNA clone. The second was uh, getting the receptor clone. And then the third was Rebau infecting these mice. And the next day, some of them were paralyzed. Yep. Amazing. It was absolutely amazing. The next day they were paralyzed? Yeah. It was that fast? Yeah, if you put enough virus Whoa. in, they will get paralyzed the next day. Whoa. Yeah. I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah, it depends on the dose. So if he probably put a range of doses in for that first experiment, then the, the highest dose next day were gone, yeah. I remember those very well. So I call them three eureka moments. Yep. Yes, they I've are. I've been lucky to have three, right? Most yep. people are lucky to have one. So I've had three, and it's been great because I have had great people working with me. Wonderful. You've had them, Anne? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I have. Yes. What was your eureka moment? First eureka moment was when um, I understood how recombination and replication work together for Lambda. Mm -hmm. it, just, it just occurred to me all of a sudden out of the blue, and it was before its time because nobody thought about it then. And, um, and it, it's all turned out to be true. That was my first eureka hmm. moment. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You've had more? Yeah, I've had a couple more. The right. next re Eureka moment was when we discovered that, um, that uh, integration uh, depends on, um, the completion of integration depends on DNA repair enzymes in the host cell. And if you don't have them, you can kill a cell. That was, that was a eureka moment. So the gaps that you get when you first uh, integrate, those are filled in by host cell repair? They're filled in by host, and uh, if, you, if you don't have the right signaling, so if you don't have your ATM or ATR mm -hmm. uh, DNA damage signal, so because the, 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 uh, the chromatin is interrupted by this new piece of DNA in right. there, <laughs> and either it's the lesion that occurs or a, maybe occasionally breaks occur, yeah. or maybe even the disturbance of the conformation of the chromatin is the signal. But there is a signal there. It's a DNA damage signal. You get gamma H2X signal there. That was a eureka moment. Hmm. I was here for that. Hmm? I was here. You were here for that. that it was, was really just cool. incredible, yeah. And that was one where a colleague helped because we did this in skid mice cells because they don't have... Mm -hmm. DNA PK, they don't have repair. And yeah, so, and actually for listeners who may not know Fox Chase's history, skid mice, melbosma, those were identified here at Fox Chase. So it comes right. back to this idea that colleagues. your colleagues make such a colleagues. huge difference. Yes, so, absolutely. So retroviruses do not integrate in skid mice? They, tr they do, they, get in they integrate, but uh, the, the cells die. So if you take mm -hmm. uh, lymphocytes from skid mice and you infect them with HIV or ASV, uh, they die, they, they apoptose. And that's because the, the DNA is integrated, but the gaps are not filled They're in. They're not filled, right. and, 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 the cell, and the cell says, hey, this is DNA right. damage, and that it's not repaired. So and P53 e is involved in that, I guess, right? No, P53 is not involved. No. You don't need P53. You can do to it. To kill, I mean, for the death induction after the well, damaged it, DNA. It, yes, yes, that's right. right. Okay. But, but it'll happen in P53 minus cells, too. Hmm. Neat. So or we, we digressed, you. yes. <laughs> On any of your three Eureka days, did you actually yell out Eureka? <laughs> <laughs> but there were some other words, I'd guess. <laughs> there, was that, there was that look that just sort of was like, wow, you're an idiot. Right. No, you're not. It's, 
I sure I didn't say you don't Eureka. Have to answer it. You I probably don't... cursed or yelled some other word. Yeah, right. <laughs> you cursed. Holy, mm. I do curse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, you can be a little salty. Actually, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say I'm impressed knowing you reasonably well that uh, your podcasts are extraordinarily G-rated. Yeah, we don't you, curse on you, the podcast. You you were veering into dangerous territory with the condom story, but but yeah, but it's not cursing. No, no I I for, I want to keep the podcast clean, so we keep our clean rating on iTunes. So I don't. Yes. Well, I don't curse I, I'm not about to change that on you. So I have a hard question for you as a polio virologist. So in, in grants, one of the things that grants are evaluated on now is significance. And unfortunately, and that's I guess an editorial on my part, oftentimes significance is associated with the number of people that get sick with your particular virus of interest. And poliovirus, happily, because of an effective vaccine, even though poliovirus is still uh, a uh, present within the world population, the proportion or the number of individuals that get sick with it decline. So how do you or how does someone like myself who works on measles right behind poliovirus and the list to be eradicated justify the significance of working with this virus if it isn't a remaining substantial human pathogen? Well, I don't think being a pathogen is the only way that you can have significant topic, right? I, I think that what you, we, we used to call them model systems, but NIH told us that they don't like model systems anymore. But it's still, they're model systems. There are systems that can teach you quite a bit. So for example, we use poliovirus to probe the interaction of viruses with with the interferon system. It's perfectly valid because there are, the virus grows well, there are lots of reagents available, and you can do experiments that probably have broader reaching consequences to just polio. So that would be one angle that I would always argue that well-studied viruses, even though they are not pathogens, I mean, lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus doesn't kill a whole lot of people, right? Yet it is one of the most studied viruses for the yeah. understanding the immune system. It's a workhorse as, as, for viral pathogens. As you well know, and I think that's completely justified. Uh, there, There is also this idea that working in certain viruses can provide you an advantage when something else pops up, and what comes to mind is HIV. So people had worked on retroviral proteases for ages and understood their necessity, and then when HIV pops up, you immediately can apply all that understanding to design antivirals against the retroviral proteases or reverse transcriptases, right? So that's, all that, that's right. all that <clears throat> previous knowledge immediately. And I think the path to HIV drug uh, discovery was made much faster because of all the work on these mouse and bird retroviruses for years before. Right, right. So there, that, and, and that's the thing about science, you never know uh, where the important advances are going to come from, and it's why you need to fund in investigators just being curious about their system. This is something the public in general doesn't understand. Yes, They right. want focused research, cure cancer or diabetes or some disease, work on it. Don't work on an obscure bacterium because you don't know what it's going to lead to, but in fact that may lead to polymerase chain reaction or restriction enzymes or any number of other well, things CRISPRs. that you can't, CRISPRs or anything you can't predict. <laughs> you have to have a certain fraction of research done which is an investigator initiated because they find it interesting. And if you have good people, then good things will always happen. I, I strongly believe that. How do you convince the public of that? That's a real problem though. It is, and part of the it issue is. is that you have to first educate them about the scientific process, how science works. You have to say, science is not about pretty pictures of viruses or nebula or oceans, but it's the process of getting to that point. And that's hard to do. It takes time, and they might not find it all that interesting. But that's part of the, what we tried to do with our outreach is to teach people how science works. And then I think, you know, if you keep going at it, and enough people go at this, and keep enforcing it, eventually uh, it will be understood that that broadly focused research is really important. That's actually particularly true for Fox Chase. In this building, Barry Blumberg, who wasn't a cancer biologist, was working on hemophilia and by some chance discovered hepatitis B virus, which turned out to be a huge pathogen for liver cancer, and then went on to develop the vaccine for it. But he didn't start off as a hepatitis researcher. 
So, yeah, the serendipity comes back again. I'm afraid that we are slowly moving away from that kind of research in this country, and we are going to lose big time. We're going to lose discoveries and advances that can help everyone's health if we don't return to letting people follow their noses. I mean, you can do a certain amount of so-called focused or translational research. I think it's fine to be a part of the whole research portfolio, but you always have to have a certain amount of letting people be curious. And I'm afraid we're getting too far away from that at this point. So this is actually a great transition into the science communication side of what you've been doing over the last five to eight years. So was it that sense of passion and frustration that the field was moving away from basic studies that kind of got you interested in doing things like the podcast and the blog? I'd love to say yes, that would sound great. But <laughs> it was really a curiosity about techniques in, in communicating that got me started. I mean, it all goes back to, to technical ability. So we wrote this textbook, and that gave me kind of a broad knowledge of virology because it's based on process and not by virus. So I had to learn about many different viruses. So I, when blogging became easy, I thought, why don't I use this platform to spread some of this understanding? So there was a component of wanting to educate people in general about viruses, but there's also this aspect that, oh, this is cool, this blogging, you can reach a lot of people, it's technically interesting. So I thought I would combine the two, and that's how that started. Uh, at, but then very rapidly I realized that I could reach a lot of people and engage them and, and generate a conversation that would be educational. So I quickly moved from that to podcasting to teaching, and, and that's really how it got started. Do you talk about, I, I'm not sure if I've actually heard you mention on a podcast, how many people download the podcast? Have you, have you talked about the, the... I don't think we have lately. Probably years ago we might have. I think when we passed um, our first 100,000 downloads, we mentioned it. But now well, we've, with TWIV, we've passed 2 million downloads. Uh, not, not since the very beginning. So we probably are over 2.5 million. We get routinely 80 to 90,000 downloads a month. So. It's, it's great. I get three or four emails a day. We have an engaged listenership who really like it, and I couldn't be happier about it. Yeah. I think as, it's, as a listener, I think one of my favorite parts are email episodes. Not Well, partly because of the questions, but also partly the diversity of individuals who are asking the questions, both in terms of where they're from, but also where they're, where they're at career-wise. You get mm -hmm. kids who are asking you questions as well as people who aren't scientists and full professors. So I don't know any other medium that does that. Television doesn't do it. Radio doesn't do it to the extent that we do. We read every email that we get. I think it's, it's really unique. So just before this podcast, you presented to some of the Fox Chase postdocs a, a, a talk on science communication and how to catalyze your own interest. And I actually thought it would be worthwhile for the listeners to hear if they were so motivated and wanted to become part of the science communication movement to hear a little bit, at least from you, about how you might start that. How you might start communicating with Right, with how, do you, how you take ownership of your own science. So, so all, first of all, all, all of us who are doing science have an obligation to tell the public about it because for the most part we are supported by money, tax money, and the public deserves to know uh, how its money is being spent. So if you have a grant or you're supported in some way by government funds, you should do something in some way to reach the public and tell them what you're doing. And there are many ways that you can do it. Now the social media tools of the internet have made this really, really easy. So I blog, which is a very low uh, barrier activity. You can easily set up a blog for free and write about what it is that you're passionate about. And that's the key. If you're passionate about something, it'll come through in your writing. Pick something you really really want to talk about. It can be very focused and you don't have to do it very often. You could, But you do have to do it regularly. Once a week or once every other week would be great. So blogging is one thing you can do. Podcasting has a higher barrier. It's not for everyone, but a number of people have started podcasts influenced by us. Now, I would say six or seven or eight people have done this, including the most recent is, is our farmer listener in uh, Minnesota who has started a podcast uh, podcast about farming. Really? I'm just That's looking great. forward to, <laughs> to listening to that. You can just go on social media and spread the word. You can go on Twitter or Google Plus or Facebook 
and just share articles that you find interesting or make comments about what's going on in the news, eventually you will accumulate people who follow you and look for your opinion on things. And that's a very low barrier way to get into it. And I t as I tell everyone, we, we who try to communicate all have to work together. We can't view each other as competitors. And I see that often in the social media field. Someone makes a very uh, well-established website, and they don't want to share uh, the, sh the, the spotlight with anyone else. So this is not the way it, it has to work. We have to help each other. So if you start a blog or a podcast, or if you're tweeting or on Google+, Plus, anything, let me know. I will share you with everyone else that I know. So I've benefited by having lots of people following my activities now, and I can help you by getting you started. So let us know. And I, tell, I told the students yep. and postdocs that, hey, if you yep. start something, let me know. I'll publicize it. And one of your, uh, I think, postdocs said they were trying to raise money for a high school education project. Yes, and he said, can you help? I said, yeah, absolutely. I will announce it on a podcast for sure, and we'll tweet it and blog about it. I think it's important to help one another. Don't worry. You're not going to lose your market. I see this so often among, especially among science writers, they're reluctant to propagate what we do. I don't understand why. I get rarely uh, tweeted or, or blogged about by other science writers, people who do this as a profession. I don't know why, but it, I don't think that makes any sense, and the scientists shouldn't emulate that. So you've got, on the, on the positive side, many people who will elect to download the podcast or listen to podcasts mm -hmm. and educate themselves or go to the online things like Coursera, for example, and watch your lectures. Or, but there's also many, many more who don't. And where there is a clear misunderstanding about virology, anxieties about vaccinating, getting a vaccine for flu or about vaccinating your children for various unfounded fears or confusion about the difference between bacteria and viruses or whether viruses cause HIV. So for individuals that don't elect to invite science information into their, into their lives, are there ways in which we can reach out and influence people's views on science? So this is a significant problem because we are reaching people who who look for us, right. they're interested, yes. they have some kind of science yes. interest. And even though they may be farmers or truck drivers or mail deliveries, they have an interest in seeking that, this out. But there are a whole lot of people, a vast majority of people out there who don't trust science and don't want to be vaccinated and, and don't want to listen to us at all. So reaching, I think reaching them is really, really important. Um, and I think what we do is probably to intense for them to reach them. We have to do shorter and more focused things. I think a lot of people in the field are, are moving towards this conclusion. We have to devise very short and attractive ways to get the attention of people and, and tell them first at the outset how cool science is and how important it is for your life. I was just at a meeting uh, the other day where a professor from the University of Chicago and, and some of his colleagues are starting a foundation called Science Matters. And the whole point is to tell the public how much science and technology means to your everyday life. And one of their videos, which they hope to put on the Super Bowl next year as an ad, shows an iPad. And he said, if you ask any person on the street who invented the iPad, they'll say Steve Jobs. But he said, in fact, if you take every component out, you can trace this one to an NSF grant and this one to research at this mm. university. So they made a video that takes an iPad and breaks it apart and says this is from here and here and here. And then at the end, it just says science matters. And 15 seconds, that's the kind of thing. That's great. You can, that's great. I and, love it. And people will say, it. oh, mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yes. And you keep doing that over and over again. Yeah. You can start to get people's attention. So I think I would love to do sort of short focus things like that and you put them on YouTube, you, you make a billboard, science matters, and it's on the street for you know a few weeks, I think you can make impacts. But you need, of course, money to do that, you need people, you need some help. And I, I would love to do that uh, in a more substantial way, um, I, I just need more time and more money. Do you know where I can get more time? <laughs> <laughs> So actually, this was going to be one of the, no. <laughs> before my, my final couple of uh, frilly questions, that was going to actually be one of the, the final points about the education thing. You said before that you don't particularly tend to think forward to the next step. But if I forced you to do that and said, five years from now, what do you want to be doing that's different 
from what you're doing today. I suspect you'd still want to do the podcasts and the blogging, but what new things can you envision wanting to do that you're not currently doing? Well, I don't think that far ahead. How can I answer your question? <laughs> you just... So I, in five years, I probably, uh, I would guess I won't have a lab anymore. Uh, because I want to focus on this. So that in itself will be a big change, yeah, sure. right? Think of it as both of you scientists. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine not, you know, having, a not having a lab? This is what defines us. And I, I feel that I've done a lot in my lab. I could do it a long time, but I want to focus my efforts on this communicating, which I think works, but needs more effort to make it really work uh, more than it can now. So I, I, will, I can see in five years doing podcasting and still writing, but I'd like to develop the sort of videos that we just talked about, quick mm -hmm. appealing videos that help engage a broader uh, part of the public. I'd like to make shorter in teaching videos, you know, a minute, two minutes about viruses, bacteria, fungi, explain how they work and make them very appealing, graphically interesting that you put on YouTube and get millions of, mm -hmm. of hits. I think that would be the best because my kids are always showing me, hey, Dad, look at this video. It's been downloaded <laughs> nine million times. Yes, it's yes. about silly things. And I said, if I could only yes. make... Then uh, you have to make games. Uh, you have to make uh, a game is I one way to games, do it. Viruses and games. So mm -hmm. I Apparently envision cats are really big for YouTube. So if you can cats, get cats are in huge. There. My son says, "Dad, nobody cares about virus." I said, "No, that's not true. I can get people." I was talking to someone, a, 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 a philanthropist, the other day, and I said to her, "Do you want to hear some cool facts about viruses?" And I reeled off three or four of my favorites, and she was totally enthralled. She knew nothing about this. So you What's can, your favorite fact about viruses? Well, the number one, of course, is if you line up the 10 to the 30th oh, here we go. viruses on the planet, they reach 200 million light years out. It's phenomenal. Uh, if, you, um, if you put them all together, they would fill MetLife Stadium where the Super Bowl just was 100 times uh, over. Things like that. Your 8% of your genome is viral. And most people don't know these things. And they are just stunning. You know, you have in you 10 or 20 viruses at any given time for your whole life. I really only asked one example, but, but that, that was fine. <laughs> well, it's just to show that I have plenty of, uh, of yeah. examples there. Yeah. So I want to be doing that. I want to actually, my, my dream is to have a production company for educating the public about science, to do all of these activities, and to have people who have gotten their PhDs and they want to do this, and I can hire them, and we sit down at a table like this and say, okay, what's our next video going to be? And, and then we produce it. I think this would be fabulous. So look, you've learned to become aspirational. You have learned have, to think forward. Well, of forward. course, we have to change. We, we don't want to remain the same. So I want to finish up with a couple of short, rather strange questions for you. Okay, okay I'm game. So. There's a lot of discussion, especially so uh, among postdocs here and at Penn, elsewhere, um, about the time and effort that has to go into a science career, whether it's being an academic or being in biotech or, or otherwise. And a lot of postdocs are concerned about finding a career that allows them to maintain a personal professional balance, what I think is often referred to incorrectly as a work-life balance. I sort of feel like work is an important part of life. So, um, but. If I may, you're married, you've got a couple of kids. How have you navigated the work-life balance for yourself? Mm. Well, you know, you know Sheryl Sandberg? <clears throat> no. The, um, f what is it, the financial officer of uh, Facebook? She says you can't have it all. <laughs> but I, I don't agree with that. Um, I've been, so we have three kids. My wife is a scientist as well. And she's been very successful and she really has done most of the child raising, I think, and still had a career at the same time. And I've just kind of taken the trash out and helped. I, snow, I shovel the driveway when it snows. So I think having two people of, of any sort is great if you can work together. And we showed that two scientists, many others have done the same thing. Two scientists can do this. You can have a family. And I think our kids are reasonably well adjusted. I can always think of ways I, I could have done, been a better parent. but. Um, I think they're pretty good. So you can do it, and you can work hard, and then you can go home and have a family. It's just both, both parents have to work together to do this. It's not, you can't put the burden on, on one entirely because then you have discord and, and it doesn't work out. So, you know, she's had a great career. Mine's not been bad. Three kids. I have a long commute as well. It can be done. It's not impossible. 
What's one piece of advice that you wish you had gotten when you were starting out in science that you know now is true? Hmm, that's an interesting question. What one piece of advice? Hmm. Man, don't have kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, no. You'll edit that out, won't you? <laughs> no, I won't cut it out. Actually, um, it's very interesting to hear that from a man. Uh, why is that? Because that's the usually what people tell female scientists. No, don't I, have kids. I, I'm actually <laughs> very happy to. I, I never wanted to. My wife convinced me to have kids, and now I would never not have them because kids are the best. They are so cool to have. Yeah. But you have to do it on your own. You can't have. No one can convince you to have kids. So that's not really uh, what what my advice. So what advice would I? I guess I'm I'm not coming up with anything because, I guess I got really good mentorship from the start. You know, nobody gave me advice. They led by example. And I, I would watch Peter Palazzi or David Baltimore and, and learn from what they were doing. Um, and, I, and you could come up with things like, oh, uh, it's going to be really hard or it's going to be hard to keep your lab going. None of that is really important in retrospect. So I think I had everything. I had two good mentors, and I, you know, I talk about them in my seminar. I'm really grateful. They taught me everything that I need. So I can't, I can't answer that. I'm sorry. It's okay. Actually, you kind of did answer it. You sort of like you get the information you need when you need it. And I was just kidding about the kids. I, I, th I would never not have kids having gone through the experience. Oh, yes. No, that's so that's, cool. That's, I, cool. I would agree with you there. Yeah. But. With all the problems that you have, as you know, right. still, yeah. it's just amazing to, uh, it's like a super student or postdoc. It's just 10 times better because you live with them and you see them all the time. To just watch them absorb the world and discover, there's nothing better. Mm -hmm. Did they, they listen to the podcast ever? I think um, in the beginning they did. So I remember I released the first TWIV on a Saturday and I had made up the artwork and myself in, this, in the logo and the slogan and I ran it past my daughter. I said, what do you think about this? Because she has some artistic sensibility. And she said, it's really cool, Dad. And then my younger son and my older son are both heavily into computing, so they, they've listened as well. So yeah, they, they don't listen regularly, but in fact, my older son was on an early episode. Oh, I didn't I think this number one. seven or eight, he came and talked about viruses in video games. And that was cool. He was like 15 or so, and he had a good time. That's so cool. They know I do it, and they, they, they do think it's cool. My, my, my son said to me the other day that he thought it was cool that his dad had an internet presence. So <laughs> I'm glad okay. they like it. A couple more. Um, if you had one minute with the president to say anything you wanted, <laughs> what would you want to convey? Gee, you, we talked about this before. Didn't I thought it was a great question, yeah. and I figured, well... <laughs> Yeah, we, I think this came up on TWIV once, and Rich Condit may have brought it up. So if I had one minute with the president, I would actually say one of the things that I said today, that our country, our world is what it is because of science and technology, and we need to embrace it at all levels. We have to keep supporting it. We have to tell the people why it's good. We have to educate the public, and, and so we need money not only for research, but for communicating science knowledge to the public, because we can't forget about them. If you could have the definitive answer to one question in science, what do you want to know? <laughs> what's, what's at the edge of the universe? I always, that always bothers me. People tell me it's an expanding thing. Yeah. And, but what? Yeah. There's got to be something on the other yeah. side. And then they say, no, there's nothing. Because, but there can't be nothing, right? Yeah. And that is the one thing that bugs me more than histone deacetylases <laughs> or origins of replication. Because I'm, we're going to figure all that out. I have no question about that. But what's, what's at the edge? What's at the edge? Just I a really brick wall. Want. And then can I have a second one? All right. I want to know how life started and when the viruses appeared. I, I really, if I had one impossible wish, I could do anything that was totally out of reason, I would like to take a time machine and go back to the origins of life and see when viruses emerged. Because you know, we all wonder how viruses got their start. Were they there first or did they come from cells? Right. I'd really like to know that. So it's a tight race between the universe and the origin of life slash viruses. It's a fun question. I actually, so I told my lab that I was going to be doing this interview, and I asked them this question, and I got three responses that I thought were, were cool mm -hmm. to what's the one. So um, one 
response was, is there sentient life on other planets? Right. Yeah. One was, um, what are we completely wrong about as scientists? What are we, com you know, the, where the data may be right, but the interpretation is completely wrong. And then the third one was, how do I develop a perpetual motion machine? <laughs> Which I initially thought was a strange question. But if in fact that worked, this would sort of solve world energy problems and all the rest. It's yeah. a very technical kind of answer, but it's an interesting answer. Do you think there's life somewhere else in the universe? Sure. Oh, yeah. You think Absolutely. so? so why Sentient, I don't know though. Why yeah. haven't they contacted us? <laughs> would you want to contact us? <laughs> sure, why not? I mean, that's the whole thing well, that... Well, that's presuming their, their development is ahead of us. And it may not be. Well, if, look, the, the, may but the be. numbers of all the possible planets out there, there are probably Has many, many with life. Sure. Absolutely. Of some sort. But so, I mean, first of all, I'm curious to see how it would develop somewhere else. Well, look how right. long it took for it to b develop here. I mean, everything came from the Big Bang, right? Mm -hmm. So look how long everything took to develop here. It must be taking long as long at least on other, in other places. Sure. Are there viruses in those other places? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Final question. Please rank these in order of preference. <laughs> Vince, Vinny, Vincent. Vincent, Vinny, Vince. Oh, is that right? Huh. I don't like Vince. You don't like Vince. I like Vinny. If you were my friend, Vinny is number one. Mm -hmm. So you guys could call me Vinny. But uh, otherwise, Vincent, I really like Vincent. It sounds nice. It's the original name. So if I just meet someone, I'd like them to call me Vincent. But David Baltimore called me Vince all the time. And then uh, after I left his lab and we started exchanging emails, I would sign them Vincent. And at one point he said, I thought you liked Vince. And I said, no, I actually don't like Vince. Because <laughs> he used to call me Vince all the time. <laughs> it's OK. Did he start calling you Vincent, or he still calls you Vince? Call me Vinny now, actually, there which you go. is fine. He can do that. I like Vinny. I think. Did you see my cousin Vinny, the movie? Yeah. This yeah. my that's my movie because of Vinny. But I like Vinny very much. But it's very informal. So if you just meet me, Vincent is fine. Yeah. Why do you ask that? I just, just I felt curiosity. like I needed a, a final question. Okay. I've heard you, I've heard you called all three things, and I just figured surely somebody that's got permutations of their name has to have a preference. Yeah, I do have a preference, but it, I don't impose it on people. It's fine. Well, Vinny. Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> I am out of questions. Yeah. All right. Can I wrap up the show? Yes. Please do. Do you know how to wrap it up? I don't. Well, I would give it a try, and then I would embarrass myself, and that uh, would be bad news. So. Here he is being insecure. <laughs> well, it's not my show. It's your show. I'm handing you it back. You did a great job. I think, oh, thank you. I think people might like it, but you know, I'm not so interesting, so who knows? We'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. You'll find out. Well, thank you for joining. This has been uh, another episode of TWIV. You can find this at iTunes and also at twiv.tv. And if you like what we do, right now we don't want money. Someday we might. But right now what you can do to help us is to go over to iTunes and subscribe to the show and give it a rating or a star rating there. And that helps to keep us visible. And what that means is on the crowded podcast pages at Apple's iTunes, it keeps us on the front page where people will discover us because we really want people to learn about this cool science called virology. And as always, we love to get your questions and comments. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. So this is the part where I thank my guests. I would say Glenn Rawl is at the Fox Chase Cancer Center. Thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. And Ann Skalka is also at the Fox Chase Cancer Center. Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>